Good evening and welcome to the Highgate Select Board meeting for December 2nd of 2021. Our first order of business is the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, thank you for joining us. Do we have any public comment uh, that is not on the agenda? Sue, what the heck? <laughs> the only thing I would say, Sharon, <laughs> is we did the Christmas tree light service last night and I thought it went very well for the first time doing it. I was very happy and I think people are very happy um, with the outcome. So. And I did get rid of some of the fires last night for the parade. And I will be getting rid of the rest of them this week. Okay. Yes, yeah, so a big thank you to the fire department and Mrs. Lofian. They did a wonderful job in the park. Yes. And the library is selling donation or er, selling memorial bulbs to put on their Christmas tree, so if you want to honor a loved one, whether it be two-legged or four-legged, they are taking donations to support the library. Um, I think it's five dollars a bowl. So reach out to our librarian and she'll set you right up. Okay. We have a guest speaker today about the economic strategy study. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to be viewer friendly. Okay. If you don't mind. But I'm also going to go up there. Because I'm an economist and it's an occupational <laughs> flaw that I have to have a PowerPoint. But it's only four pages. Which, for those of you that know me, that's really good for me. Um, because I like long ones. Um, and um, we're coming to the end of a, about an eight and a half month, nine month process now which started back in, in, in mid-March. Um, uh, it, it was a logical follow-on to the airport uh, infrastructure expansion study uh, that we did, and we actually used a lot of the building blocks that we found in that as a way to kind of channel our energies for kind of identifying what we thought were good opportunities. Um, I felt a little bit like the mad scientist um, at my computer. Um, because one of the things that I thought was important about this was that um, Michael Crane and I not be the limiting factor in terms of identifying what we think are good ideas. And Michael is upset that he couldn't be here tonight, but he had an unavoidable conflict um, with his uh, Delaware uh, River Basin client uh, in the Middle Atlantic states, and he's given them their final report tonight, and I'm here giving you the final report. Uh, for this study, uh, but Michael was uh, very helpful. We were happy to have him. He's uh, an expert in community development and some of these strategic economic development things, and and so it was it was great that we had him. And he actually participated at some of the planning commission meetings uh, that Michael was at and those kinds of things. So um, we looked at the whole panoramic view of what's possible, and you know when we did the analysis. In the previous study, where I identified the key industries uh, for the town, um, they ran kind of the gambit. Um, you also are, have been very good as a community at leveraging um, what, I, what economists call leveraging. That means finding other folks' money to do the things and staff resources to do the things that the town wants to do. And you have developed, I believe, incredible private sector uh, partnerships. Uh, partnerships with um, your other strategic parker partners like uh, Northwest Regional Planning, Franklin County Industrial Development Corp, um, <laughs> rural development folks, um, even the state agency of commerce and community development through which this grant came, um, uh, the Northern Borders Regional Council, um, other municipalities in the area. 
Um, you know, the whole thing is predicated on, uh, you know, getting the municipal water and wastewater up to the airport. It involves interacting with another municipal, municipal body in the, adjacent to the community. Um, the partners with the uh, managers of the airport, the state agency of transportation, the Federal Aviation Administration. I sit, I sit here and I, and I say, geez, you've actually put a lot of effort into cultivating these relationships. And so when we looked at the realm of the possibility of the possible alternatives, we thought that those strategic partnerships could be utilized and it's gonna come down to you as policymakers, the pot planning commission and the DRB people as to what kind of a role do you wanna play in pursuing one or more of these opportunities that we've identified. Um, and when you read the recommendation section of the report, which is the second half, Sorry, it's 50 pages, um, but um, there's a lot of, I think, opportunities for the town. Um, from doing the airport infrastructure expansion study to doing this study, I am just impressed, quite frankly amazed, at the opportunities that the town has before it going forward in the next five to 10 years. And if you layer on top of that, the crazy stuff that's happening federally with all the fiscal resources that are bouncing around and coming down to the county and the individual municipal level and the state level. Um, this, right now, we're staring at a once in a generation opportunity to do some things. Um, this development asset that's in and around the airport um, that you, as a town, earmarked for growth in terms of what your zoning, planning and zoning was back in the 70s, now has an opportunity really to come forward, in part because of all those strategic relationships that we talked about before, and the fact that you have a very cooperative private partner who, you know, sure, he wants to make a buck, just like everybody else, um, but there is, an, there is a good solid asset there that once the municipal water and wastewater gets up there, okay, you have an opportunity as a community to not only use moral suasion to make sure that the high paying, high quality employers go in there that are consistent with what we've identified as the key industry employers in the community, but also as a policy making body with the planning commission and the DRB, you have the opportunity to, to set some site review or development review criteria that can make sure that if moral suasion doesn't work, okay, with the landowners and with the partners like the airport, okay? You can use the leverage that you have in development review to make sure that we don't underutilize that resource. This is, and this is not only a town resource, people in the whole region are excited for the opportunity that we have in the community. And so that's kind of the whole background um, in terms of uh, what we came together with and I guess we can go to the next slide. This is where we are in the process. Um, recommendations are drafted. We're now taking comments. And um, after, a, uh, after a few, after a week or so, after the town's had it, I'd like to like circulate it to Tim Smith and get comments from him. I don't want to give it to other people before you guys have a chance to look at it. That's kind of bad form. Um, so uh, th th it's all done. I'd like to finalize it in the next couple of weeks. Um, I know that we have to do it by the end of the month because that's uh, the, when the termination of the grant happens. So I'm sorry. That's why I gave it to you in two installments. I didn't want to give you the whole thing in one installment and then have you sit there and say, I got to read 100 pages. Okay. <laughs> no, you only have to read 50 because everybody, we sent the first half, which laid the context for everything. That, back, that was back in May um, when we shared that with everybody. Um, there are a large number of opportunities. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that's a good thing for the community. Um, they're presented a la carte. I told you when I did this that I was gonna do my best to try to identify what the, the obligations of the town were gonna to be if they pursued one thing. And in, for each one of the alternative opportunities, I've included an estimate of incremental 
financial resources that might be needed through maybe some granting or maybe even using some of the town's own resources uh, to do some of these feasibility studies to test some of the ideas. But I also tried to think through over and above what the normal work program is for you and for the planning commission, how many extra volunteer hours were going to be required from elected and appointed officials. And of course, you still have the opportunity to appoint a citizen committee, which could defray some of those hours to take some of the burden off you. But what I was trying to do is, I know you have a normal work program. I know that work program, as a former, I'm a recovering select board member myself, as I've said to you, I was 10 years on my own town select board. I know that you have some bandwidth to handle policies and issues. Maybe that's what you are. You're the legislative policy-making body in the community. So I tried to t look at it from the standpoint of how much extra time it might take. Um, and so for each one of the initiatives, there is a table that I put in there for volunteer hours, hours from strategic partners, and mostly that's Northwest Regional Planning and FCIDC. Um, and then there's always opportunity to hire either a part-time staff or a consultant. And the way I looked at it was just say, okay, you're going to hire a consultant. What is a reasonable amount of money to undertake the feasibility studies that are needed in each one? Now, I'm not proposing you do everyone, okay? But it is a 10-year program. And when I gave it to Heidi, I said, how did you like the way I defined it next decade of your life in economic development? Um, after I sent it to her. I sent it to her while she was in Hawaii, though, so, you know. Uh, I'm sure she read it. You read it on the plane, I'm sure. Um, um, so that's where all this comes from. And you know, I wanted to let you know that I wanted to fulfill my obligation to tell you what would be the responsibilities of the town. But you, as a policymaking body, have the ability to engage in any way that you want to if you think something is worth facilitating. And you don't have to do that. But I tried to do it as if you were going to take a facilitating role, in some cases a lead role, this is what would be required. And I tried to put as many hours as I could on the Planning Commission and DRB. <laughs> <coughs> no, not really. Um, so anyway, um, as I said, the community has a lot of opportunity. And really, in, after you look at this, and if you think there are some good ideas, the really the two issues are how much skin do you want to put in the game and what kind of a role do you want to play as the policymaking body to encourage some of these things. So next slide. This is the slide from hell. Um, it's, the, it's the 10 slide and one slide uh, thing, so I could shorten my uh, thing. But you've seen this before because I've used this format the last few times. Um, we looked at lots of things. We looked at growth centers. We looked at TIF districts and all those kinds of things. And um, we went into them with enough depth. Um, and we also looked at the Federal Opportunity Zone program. Uh, because we know that we live in a dynamic world. Um, TIF district program's still out there. There's opportunity for three or four more of them, the new vintage, the 2017 vintage. I don't think you can make it through that program. I don't even think it fits the scale of the community. Let me yep. stop you. Yep. Okay, so people are watching and they have no idea what a TIF is. They oh, have no tax idea increment what a finance. Got it. Is. Got they it. have no idea what you're talking about. <clears throat> These are, sorry. These are uh, state designations that allow the community to qualify for special financial tools that can be used instead of using tax dollars and the town's uh, money to do it. And so tax increment financing, basically what you do is you define a district that's going to need some infrastructure. And you define that area. You put your infrastructure, the cost of infrastructure in there. You freeze the value of that area once you define it, and then you can um, uh, collect taxes from the private sector growth to help defray what you're probably going to have to do, which is issue some debt to do the infrastructure because that infrastructure has to be developed prior to the, prior, the private development. But you can freeze the valuation and then you can take 70 or 80 percent of the federal, of the federal, the state education property tax um, and use that to pay debt service um, over the 20 year period or however long, usually 20 years you take the debt out. The other thing you have to do is there are other requirements. You have to dedicate at least 80% of your own municipal taxes to servicing the debt as well um, uh, from, that, from those uh, increases in value. But um, it's, it, that's a big town program. It requires a lot of planning. It requires um, uh, you, you to hire 
probably a, a development consultant to be with you all along the way, and then that's a 20-year commitment because there's also a lot of reporting requirements. You get audited by the state auditor, all those fun things. You probably remember what happened in St. Albans and that and they got into a real fight with the state auditor over whether or not they were spending their money properly for the hotel that was part of their TIF. But um, we didn't recommend that. Um, there's Federal Opportunity Zone program, which allows people to make uh, investments in certain areas that qualify as economically disadvantaged. And those people can invest in real estate development, realize income from those investments, and postpone their capital gains uh, for a long period of time, and in some cases get some partial forgiveness of it. The Opportunity Zone program was an artifact of the previous federal administration. If we were go to that, it we're a little bit late in the game. And unless you had something ready to go right now, most of the investors couldn't take full advantage of the capital gains exclusions. And so if we, we would have to have something that they could invest in by the end of this year, and it's already in December. So that's prob they're probably going to go somewhere else where they, where they can get the full deduction. So we're not recommending that you do that. But we did look at the State Growth Center, too. You've done Village Center, so you're a little bit familiar with what that is. This is Village Center on steroids. Um, and it requires smart growth, planning and zoning, and all that kind of stuff. And um, it's just, it's too long of a process. It's too expensive of a process for what you're going to get. Um, relative to what we're recommending, which is um, the potential to help some of the other your sister municipalities, and then eventually you pursue what they call project-based TIF which is different than the TIF district, because in a TIF district, you can have multiple projects and multiple issues of municipal debt um, over that period. Project-based TIF is tailor-made for small communities, but you only get one bite at the apple. You get one infrastructure project, one issuance of debt, and one opportunity in one area to, to grow the grand list so you can get the state education tax revenues and the incremental municipal revenues to service that debt. It's not in law yet. You recall last year, there was a lot of discussion about it. Our whole delegation from Franklin County um, was bought in to the notion. There are communities like um, uh, uh, Jericho and a couple of others that are really, have already developed projects that they want to go take to the legislature. The legislature said, we're not going to allow the Vermont Economic Progress Council to review it like they do for TIF districts. We want to review every single one and test it for its merits. Um, so the study recommends that you support the other municipalities. We do a conceptual project-based TIF for ourselves between now and say at the end of January and February. Participate in the discussions for the legislature and say, yes, we support what these folks are doing. We think it's a good idea. We want to use project-based TIF, but we're recommending you use project-based TIF for the second phase of the airport infrastructure expansion. It's too late to use it for the first because you, we've already had the public vote for the debt and you have to get your TIF plan approved before you have your public vote so we can't use it for phase one. Um, but for phase two we can. Okay. I know that phase two is just right now kind of conceptual. Okay, here's my, here's my question. It's <laughs> phase, two, uh, phase two is conceptual still. Okay. Um, but we have about 18 months to, uh, about 14 months to figure out something enough for a project-based TIF if that's the way you as a board and planning commission and DRB and this town staff want to go. Well, I okay. think he's, I don't mean to speak for you, Ty, but are you wondering what phase one and phase two are? Yeah, yeah, I know I, what I think phase one is yep. uh, by hearing what you're... Yep. Uh, well, phase one, we already had the vote. We yes. already know what the district is. Uh, we already know what the yeah, where the infrastructure is going and things like that. We already know who the involved property owners are in phase two. We don't know that. We don't know that. But we're, we have an opportunity to do another phase, okay? And the other reason we don't want to use it for phase one is the capital stack's pretty much complete for phase one. We can't use project-based TIF for the village center infrastructure because that capital stack's almost done. We might as well use it for something where there's a significant capital stack gap that we need to use. And that's why we're recommending that we use it in phase two. Now, I understand Heidi quipped at me when I said, um, we well, can use it for phase two. She goes, you're trying to tell me when I'm already pregnant with the first baby, when am I going to have my second? And that's a hard thing to conceptualize right now. Um, 
something but, like that. <laughs> but again, but again, we're looking at a five to ten year window here. Okay, and so that's why you know we're thinking that there there would be a phase two. If phase two doesn't work out for looking at it at the twenty twenty three legislative session. Hopefully, there's enough interest, and the legislature says okay, you could do it in twenty four or twenty five if that works out better in terms of the plan. Okay, but um, you should use something like that for a meaningful part of a development capital stack, not for ones that you've almost nailed between the phase one and the airport infrastructure study and the infrastructure stuff for the village center, the wastewater for the village center, okay? So that was one of our recommendations. Again, it's only our recommendation. You can tell us to go pound sand if you don't think that that's a good idea. Then we had a bunch of other um, issues. The first area that we looked at for opportunities was to support a production agriculture. Um, Obviously, some feasibility studies are going to have to be done for each one of these components. Um, but they are things that plug into the Vermont Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets 2021 to 2030 plan, where they've identified acute shortages in these areas in support of localizing the supply chain for production agriculture, which is very important to the community. If we want to have a rural working landscape, if we want to support our local farmers, we have to do more to build markets and to localize the food supply chain. So the number one opportunity um, was to create a high gate agricultural exchange place. This would be virtual. This would be analogous to a 24-hour farmer's market that's done uh, through the internet. Northwest Regional Planning already does a lot of food to plate. In my mind, they might be a logical host for something like this. You need to do a feasibility study to see if that kind of access works, whether there can be enough product to meet the demand. There's a lot of demand out there right now, and you also need to have somebody think through the technological <coughs> issues of where it would be cited and what would be required to maintain it. It's a good way to build markets for a growing part of the demand, which is people are demanding locally sourced food. People throughout New England like our brand. So if we give them the opportunity to access it, we can build markets for the farmers, we can probably build more sustained and critical mass production, which would be good for production agriculture. That's the reason for this. Um, the second thing that we're thinking about is, and I know that Tim is a little leery of incubators, Tim Smith at FCIDC, um, but we think there's an opportunity for a food and beverage business incubator. Could be housed within the community, could be in the area um, out by the airport um, with its, when it has municipal water and wastewater. Um, incubators can be tricky. Tim will tell you that they rely on getting a strong anchor tenant there to commit to be involved. But what we were thinking is that the one that's kind of around the Morrisville area that's been very significant uh, for people getting food production out of their kitchens and into a commercial situation. There's a paradigm for how it can be done. There's a way to approach it. They're actually trying to do a commercial, a shared commercial kitchen now in the Rutland area. There's an organization down there that's been working out and rehabbing buildings and trying to help build markets for their production agriculture around there all the way over to the Connecticut River. <coughs> it's not rocket science, um, but you have to have good enabling conditions and, and you need a good check on the feasibility, not only of whether or not there's a market for it, but whether or not there's the capacity to build a business model that would be successful. And I don't think the town probably wants to do that, but the town may want to facilitate um, <coughs> helping someone who might do that to understand the opportunity that they might go forward with. That's again, that's a, a, a defining role of what policymakers um, would like to do. Um, the third area that we want to consider is there's a significant shortage of co-packing for dairy for products. There's a significant shortage of cold storage. And I lump them together. Michael yelled at me for doing that because they are two different things. Um, but you can, do a, you can do a feasibility study on one or both individually, or maybe you could do them together. Uh, the, best I, the best example locally of a co-packing facility is Franklin Foods. Um, there's also a yogurt co-packer down in the Brattleboro area um, that's used this model um, successfully. Um, there are 
is not a lot of cold storage for agricultural products anywhere um, in Vermont. It's been one of the things in the food, uh, Vermont Agency of Agriculture's food um, uh, plan, uh, strategic plan for the next 10 years. They recommend this highly. They want to find a way to stimulate more capital investment in those two areas. And so we lump them together um, because over 10 years might be able to do both. Maybe you want to pick one first and do another one based on what you know the opportunities may be. But we think that that's a potential good opportunity to help build your production agriculture base. Can you explain exactly what co-packing is? Uh, taking <coughs> contract uh, product packaging and, 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 um, and aggregating for local producers. So you take a, maybe some stuff from the co-op and, and put it under a label and, and do product runs. It's contract, uh, it's contract product manufacturing and processing. Um, this next one I was a little skittish about, considering there's a little bit of history in, in northwest Vermont with this. Uh, but there is a critical shortage of slaughterhouse and meat processing facilities. There's a mobile one, and I think the closest one here is Ferrisburg. Uh, and then there's one over in, uh, in uh, New York, across the border. <coughs> right, you see their trucks all over. Champlain Beef, you see all, see all over the place. Um, uh, there is a demand for locally and humanely raised meat. Um, and the problem is, is that most of the slaughterhouses that are out there are on a scale that they don't really fit with small producers, uh, either small um, livestock operations or dairy farms that are trying to sell their cull cows, um, you know, for meat. Um, it's mean and nasty to the animals themselves. If you've got to ship them over a long period of time, it hurts the final product in the opinion of some. <coughs> and the smaller producers and the smaller livestock operations don't fit well with the larger commercialized slaughterhouses. Um, and it's in the opinion of lots of folks and in the Vermont Agency of Agriculture 10-year plan, it's holding back um, producers smaller producers like we have here in northwest Vermont and, and in the town. So that's a recommendation uh, uh, to examine the possibility of citing one of those facilities in town. All the previous things that happened over a decade ago notwithstanding. Um, and then the last one, and I have to thank Michael for this, when we had the Planning Commission and the DRB together when we had a meeting, um, Michael said, I'd like you to think about cow power because the town had a project that go through the development review process. VEC has a renewable methane-based net metering program <coughs> um, out there. And um, in terms of supporting production agriculture, it could be very helpful. Green Mountain Power has a very successful cow power program. Um, they've developed um, uh, levels of uh, net metering payments to the producers that use these anaerobic methane digesters for their cow manure. Um, and they figured out how much it gets to, how much they need to pay the farmers to incent them to get into the program. They've identified that there's a significant number of households that want to be linked to renewable power sources, and so they've put the two together. Um, Green Mountain Power does it just to recover its costs. <coughs> uh, it doesn't make any money. But it's enough that you know it reduces methane. It gives the farmers a byproduct after the digestion of the manure. They can use it for bedding, and it cuts down on things like nuisance uh, nuisance odors for the neighbors and all those kinds of things. So we're recommending that you examine whether or not you want to have put together expedited development review criteria for that uh, for the DRV. Maybe working through the planning commission again. You know, some, com some communities, when they do these kinds of energy things, set up an ad hoc energy committee just for the purposes of evaluating that. So you may want to consider doing a town energy committee for the purposes of looking at renewable energy. And this is one of the first areas that they could look at that could take some of the burden off you and the DRB and the Planning Commission. But we think it's something that if you're serious about supporting production agriculture base in the community, this might be a good opportunity uh, to get involved. That, I mean, that metering is helpful in reducing <coughs> the costs for the producers. 
it also can be done on small units, mm -hmm. as little as 90 cows. You don't need 1,200 cows to do it. Most of the ones that are presently available are quite large plants that may not fit in well, but there, there's, in Sweden, there's conceptually um, uh, and, and actually farms where this works, where yeah. you can do it with 90 cows and uh, some of them just bring in all the electronics and bring in all the equipment and the farmer just supplies them in order. And then, there are, there, uh, we put website links in our report where you can look at the profile of EEC renewable methane net metering program and we also put links to the cow power program from GMP. Um, they, the GMP program's been around for nearly 20 years. They, I think they have something like 18 farms that participate. Some of them are pretty large. The first one was the Foster Farm in uh, Bridport that came on in, I think, 2002 for them. Question on that. Yeah. Is, that is there any studies that show that it, it, going that route with a farm uh, limits or reduces the amount of equipment on the roads? Oh, I, 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 I believe it probably does, um, uh, but you know I don't know if anybody's done that kind of a, the detail uh, of a study. Uh, I mean, you know, by digesting the manure, you cut down on methane as a natural, you know, a natu as a natural reduction in emissions. Um, I think the cow power program for Green Mountain Power, they're advertising something that it, it produces enough power to uh, take care of 32,000 homes, something like that. So it's not insignificant. Um, and you know the the byproducts of it after you you know the the anaerobic digester you know takes in the manure. Uh, I mean it gives the opportunity you know for you to use it for bedding and things like that, which you know other than just you know putting it in a concrete and spreading it. <clears throat> and it has obviously it has the other um, benefit of reducing phosphorus emissions, which are some of the things that have been impacting the lake. So anyway, so we're recommending that you investigate maybe having an expedited procedure at the, at the development review level uh, to enable uh, your producers to take advantage of that, assuming that you can work with VEC to get them to give them a rate, which makes it worthwhile for the farmer to participate, things like that. And the nice thing is, it's already a program out there you can copy. You have to make it up. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, <coughs> then um, we get beyond production agriculture. Um, we're not recommending that you let up at all on what you do with FCRDC or any of the other strategic partners. Um, you know, Heidi does things like she participates on boards, you know, when FCRDC is talking about updating their strategies for how they're going to attract people. Obviously, with the reopening of the Canadian border, um, it's going to make it maybe a little bit easier uh, on the recruitment side. Or maybe it's a perfect double-edged sword sometimes. Uh, Sometimes um, when you develop obstacles at the border, you encourage people to come down and establish <laughs> U.S. operations. But I think allowing people to come through the border less impeded is actually going to help. Um, we have all sorts of good examples of that with Barry Calibits of the world and those kinds of things. Um, and obviously, um, the developable asset out around the airport, once the first phase is done with the infrastructure, um, you need to continue to participate with FCIDC and your partners because you want them to put in high quality jobs. You don't want to take that scarce developable resource and have it filled with a bunch of office jobs or something like that. Um, some, there's some role for office and warehousing, of course, but um, you don't want to miss the opportunity for some of those higher paying manufacturing jobs to go in there that could use they could use some municipal water and wastewater resource there. So we're not recommending you stop anything. We're not recommending you let up with the three you know, uh, uh, village areas or the, the state designations and not, not let go any of that. But at the same time, <coughs> just doing more of the same thing obviously has its limits. Um, you have a partner with the airport. I think that there's an opportunity to do some aviation stuff with the, with the uh, expansion of the airport uh, runways and things like that. There's opportunities for freight and cargo, okay? There's opportunity with a high school for uh, aviation training. Um, you know, uh, and mostly equipment maintenance and repair and things of that nature. There's all sorts of opportunities, I think, out there to work with the airport. And the good news is you can cite those on the airport. The FAA limits what can be cited on the airport without an exemption. It has to be aviation use or you've got to get an exemption from them and they almost never give you the exemption. 
Um, so anything that's non-aviation probably is on the adjacent uh, parcels and things of that nature. Um, I think you should continue to talk to Tim about, he's familiar with the, what we've identified as strategic industries of the town. I think you should push Tim to identify employers that give you those high rates of return. Um, when working with Jim or any other landowner out there, and Jim Harrison, or any other landowner out there in terms of recruiting people, you want to recruit higher paying jobs. It would be a tragic situation if we just ended up with a bunch of 15 and 18 dollar an hour jobs out there uh, at that, not, not that they're anything to sneeze at. There's a roll all across the spectrum of wages, but you have the opportunity to put some real high paying jobs in there that'd be good for workers in the region and good for you know, uh, kids coming out of the schools and, and allow them to earn their daily bread closer to home rather than going to Burlington at the, or South Burlington to get their jobs. Um, there are also um, some opportunities um, with Department of Homeland Security, National Guard, those types of things out there. And obviously, you guys need to continue to nurture those to see what makes sense as part of a mix of employers that may use that uh, developable, uh, developable resource. The other thing you need to do is you need to continue. We, we gotta get, um, we got to get with our partners and make sure that we get that broadband out as ubiquitously as it can. Um, that's something you're already doing. We're not recommending that you don't do it. Um, and that's chasing infrastructure development dollars that you've already gotten a little bit of a chunk of, but there maybe is an opportunity for more as part of the bipartisan bill that's just passed. Um, 2.2 billion more dollars is going to rain down on Vermont for that. So we ought to be at the table with our hand out, actually not like that, doing this, doing this. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, that's got to continue to be done. Um, we talked about cow power. And then, reluctantly, um, because it was in the RFP, because some of the folks in the DRB and the Planning Commission, and because some of the select board folks said, we want to understand a little bit more about these impact fees. Let me be upfront and honest. We recommend that you not do it. Okay? Do not do it. Even residential impact fees, because you don't want to discourage population growth because it's good for your commercial business space. And by the way, the community lost people between the 2010 and 2020 census. While the rest of the county grew, the town lost people. But I understand that there is some sentiment, and I don't think it's without basis, I think it has a basis, that somehow the community is one of the passive least resistance for people with residential development, and they're causing the cost burden. So, we're saying, okay, we don't want you to do it, but if you insist on doing it, do a study because it has to follow Vermont statute, it has to be related to your capital budget, and there has to be a formal study that's done so it can pass legal and common sense muster with the community if you were going to go in that direction. Now, most people don't have what they call residential impact fees. They do have impact fees for things like safe, public safety, um, e recreation and all those kinds of things that are tied to residential development that you can think about. But impact fees are used for capacity support, not for operating expenses. So they can be used for you to expand your cap capacity to serve things like you had to build another park or something like that. And it, as long as it was consistent with the utilization levels that are out there, there are some guardrails out there that say that, you know, for every 5,000 people you need this kind of, you've got to do those kinds of studies to make the, the logical nexus to those capital expenditures in order to assess a per bedroom or a per unit fee to help you with the capital cost association with serving the growth costs in the community. Um, we give you a little chart, we give you some sites and the statutes that got to be followed and I said okay if you're going to do this what are the volunteer hours what probably the cost of the study to do it um, and we've seen lots of these studies um, out there uh, there are at least a dozen firms that do 
these studies and they specialize in these things and they know what to do. So if you want to go down this route, which we're not encouraging you to do, it's we loaded the gun for you in order to, so you can pull the trigger if you want. And so um, that's it. Can I ask a question about? Uh, can I talk to the select board and then we can go to the audience? Because the select board should have the chance to answer the ask their questions first. Any questions? Quite honestly, there's so much information. That, uh, <laughs> well, yeah, I got about I got about halfway through your 54 page report, <laughs> and then I went to the synopsis at the end. Well, that's only the so, second half. Yeah, that's only the second half. That's what you say. Yeah, it was good, but yeah. uh, there's a lot of info in there. The community has a lot of opportunity, and. We looked at things that looked like it was a good fit with what the community has said about itself, what its vision is, what it wants, when we look at the town plan. And so, okay, what are the types of things that would fit with that? And like I said, it's a menu. We don't expect you to probably do more than three or four of them out of all of them. And as a matter of fact, the reason that we went so much into describing the things that we didn't recommend was, is because I say in the report, we understand that things change. So there may be an opportunity to dust off something um, when circumstances change. And that was the reason, even though we didn't do Opportunity Zones, even though we didn't do TIF District, even though we didn't do Growth Center, um, circumstances could change, which bring it into the realm of possibility. And you may want to reconsider that, because we know that, that we want to have a living list of opportunities. And 10 years is a long time. It is. But man, it was fun to think about. In the report, and you mentioned up there yeah. too, you, you talked about, I can't remember exactly what you're talking about delaying until the 2023 legislative session. Project based TIF. Okay, which we don't want to do to begin with. Well, unless it's a one shot deal, right? Uh, one project deal. Well, um, no, they want to do those. I think you, I, 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 I don't, the, the reason that I'm saying is just do something conceptual is. Um, to do all the planning and the financial analysis and the financial projections and talking to people about what the growth expectations could be for the area in which you do it, that's a lot of work. I mean, that's probably a five-digit number in terms of hiring somebody to help you figure that out, okay? Um, I believe if you put something together conceptual, even if it's not anywhere near being done, you can at least get Heidi or somebody, one of our partners, to get sit at the table and articulate, this is something that Heidi is interested in and we're interested for this. And you could be supportive of the legislative deliberation. So let's try to get two or three municipal project-based TIFs put together and approved by the legislature to go forward. That means the concept's okay. So then the town can get serious about if it wants to do it, particularly in and about the airport, you know, for the next phase out there a development and again I'm looking out 10 years not five years I'm you know three years I'm, su I'm suggesting that the earliest you could do it is for the 23 session with a plan that was specific enough that could be reviewed and approved and then you could implement even if you got it approved next year and you weren't going to start infrastructure work until 25 or something like that but you could at least get the nod from the legislature so that you would know that if you put together the full plan, you had a chance of being approved and that the legislature hadn't poo-pooed the concept. Because last year, it looked, we had a lot of support from our senators, our Franklin County senators and our reps, and it didn't really get anywhere. It, did, they, did, it didn't, they didn't say no, and they said, well, we'll continue to think about it, but they didn't say yes. So instead of going through the planning now, particularly because it's hard because we don't know what the second phase is going to be, or maybe there's not going to be a second phase. If there's not going to be a second phase, then you wouldn't do this. Maybe you try to do it in one of the village centers that you already have or something. But it seemed to me, <clears throat> after talking to everybody and taking in all the information, that we've got a pretty good capital stack for phase one airport infrastructure expansion. We've got a pretty good capital stack for the village center. What's one place where we've probably got a big gap? And in the overhang after all this federal money raining down on us, we might go for four or five years where we don't see very much. Well, this could be a tool so that the town wouldn't necessarily have to go on the hook for funding everything. It could fund a portion of it through a town vote you know, to issue some debt. 
Um, but this might be a tool that will enable you to go the next leg of the journey and continue the momentum. I mean, once, I think once people start going in out there and seeing what the opportunity is and see what the great location is and things like that, I think you're going to have to start beating them off with sticks. So you want to start to think about, okay, what do we do after the current phase, all the developable assets are gone? You, there's a lead time to that. You've got to get out in front of it by a couple of years. Otherwise, you'll miss the opportunities. That was the reason for that. That was the reason for not doing it this year. And, and, and I'll do deference to Heidi's analogy. It was correct. <laughs> it was blunt, but it made the point. Um, um, and, um, but at the same time, we want to keep thinking. You know, I'm, I'm the type of person that, okay, to me, phase one's already done because we got the town vote, we got the plans and everything else. Now, okay, what do we do next? And what do we do next to keep the momentum up? Because I think that's what you've all said that you're interested in to do because we want to have the opportunity to create good job opportunities for the kids. There are so many people that leave here and go to Burlington, South Burlington, Winooski, Colchester area, okay, the numbers are staggering. The town, it's over 900 people. The county is like 20,000. So we do some stuff to maybe keep them, maybe the, maybe the people in St. Louis will turn around and go the other way because they got a good job opportunity. So anyway, that's, that was the reasoning behind all this. Um, I don't do a lot of this type of stuff. I'm doing this project for this community because I believe in it. And I got to tell you, I, I think last March, I think it was, I said to you, rarely have I done a project where when I started, the opportunities were larger at the end than at the beginning. Usually it's the other way around. That's why this is such an incredible opportunity, I think, for the community. And I'd like to say something, too. Uh, I've known Jimmy Harris for <coughs> 50 years, and for him to bring back to his own town that he was brought up as and raised here in Hagee Falls to come back and give the, the town back. I think it's just wonderful. I, I think you've got, the town's got tremendous strategic partnerships across the board. Right. I, I, it's very rare that that's the case. Uh, you talked about the opposition for impact fees. Now I'm on board with your your way. Uh, you know, if I, if I saw something a development like Severance Corners in Colchester come here, and we needed three more fire trucks and a place to put them, absolutely. But my question to you is thoughts on one percent local sales tax. Um, my initial thought is right now it won't work here. You're not town of you're not town of uh, St. Albans. You don't have a Walmart. You don't have a uh, you don't have a center. Um, I mean, one of the things that people miss in local option taxes sometimes is it's not just what your businesses collect, but what your residents also pay through e-commerce <laughs> too gets collected in that. Um, and a lot of times. People, you know, when they use the tax department statistics, they don't understand that that's just merchant collections of sales and use. Um, I think there may be a point in time for you to do. I mean, everybody's doing it. Um, that can that can do it. That has a significant retail base. You don't have that here, okay? You want to build it. It's just like I think impact fees send the perfect mixed metaphor. We're all for development. Come to us and we'll we'll fee you, okay? I think that's at your point where you are. Where you're trying to build something, I don't think that's a good idea. If you, if somebody comes here like Severance Corners, okay, you don't need impact fees. You need exactions tied specifically to the cost of development. So you know it's not unusual in the Act 250 um, realm of possibilities that when somebody comes in and they want to build a five-story building and the town says okay, that usually comes with a hook and ladder truck, okay, or a big contribution to one. Okay, there are other mechanisms that can be used to fund. The, the, capacity, the capacity to handle the growth of the community level, okay, other than impact fees. And they can be tied to specific instances of growth, and that is, that is as it should be, okay? If the people are coming, if developers are coming in to develop, and they're getting the benefit of that development 
but they're not covering the costs that they're indirectly foisting on the community, the community has an obligation to its taxpayers to say to them, well, wait, we need you to help here, here, and here, because we understand from what you expect for growth that's going to have implications on our capacity to cover the cost of growth. And that's why you have planning commission members, development review committee members, and that's why you pay these guys the big bucks to make the helps. So what you're just saying... And that's about 12 and a half cents an hour, I think the last... Or actually, the last, my last three year, uh, I think I worked that out, it was about three and a half cents an hour. Uh, that I, and I was chair. <laughs> It's gone now. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what you've just said is something I hadn't heard you say before. Mm -hmm. um, but it's very important because that is something that the Planning Commission was very nervous about, was that idea that the taxpayer base couldn't support what it would need for large housing infrastructure to come mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm saying that we could change that by... Participating in the Act 250 process and get mitigation. Absolutely. Okay. Well, that's, that's what it's there for. That is... Uh, that's what it's there for. For me, that's new information and good information well, because that... I'm sure I'm always full of stuff. <laughs> yeah, hey, I know. Some people don't think... And it's you're excited, too. Some so. people don't necessarily believe it's information that I'm full of. <laughs> but I think that would... Um, there's ease the mind of a lot of people about impact uh, fees. All, all you have to do is I ask know. me. I'm full of good and bad ideas. Well, there's I a whole science to it. There's a whole science. They're called exactions for growth. There's a whole area. There's a whole discipline in development review related to that. Well, that's what we needed, right there. Uh, I, <laughs> impact fees was in the RFP, yes, I the know. town administrator was interested in them, the DRB was interested in them, I got flack from the planning commission when I said, no, we're not going to do that, that's not economic development, and they got mad at me. Imagine, yeah, somebody got why. mad at me. Yes, we didn't know there was an option. I, and I said it a lot nicer than Michael did. Uh, I'm sure. <laughs> okay. So I went way too long. I told Heidi I could do this in 10 or 15 minutes because of I knew that wasn't going to work. <laughs> well, I'm excited about this. I'm excited for the opportunities for the community, okay? And I believe you have a wide open realm of possibilities, but it's not going to be without getting out of your comfort zone, and it's not going to be without a lot of hours on the part of the citizens, elected appointed officials, and um, I always remember when we brought Don Cloud in, where he talked about putting skin in the game. And it's a long-term skin. It's not just one and done and things like that. It's a commitment to it. And I meant what I said at the at back end of the first half, back in May. If the board isn't committed to doing something and doing something in a substantial way, or it doesn't have think it has the will of the body politic to do that, don't do anything, okay? But you'll miss out on opportunities if you don't. <coughs> I, when I was a select board chair, if I was sitting where you were, I'd want to be select board. I would have, I would have ran for a fourth <laughs> term instead of stepping down. She's up in March. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Is it a fourth term? Uh... Uh, yeah, I think it's third. Third? Yeah. Yeah, like I said, I'm a recovering locally elected official, too. <laughs> and every time I go to my select board, I'm still my RPC. I've been the RPC uh, Metropolitan Planning Commission <coughs> uh, delegate. Everybody knows what a Metropolitan Planning Commission is. There's a federal entity that guides transportation funding, federal funding, and things like that. I've been on the MPO board <laughs> and the RPC board in my community for 21 years. And Jim Harrison poured the concrete on my house about three weeks ago. My new house over in Shelburne. <laughs> and I had to go tell my select board that I'm no longer going to be a resident, so I don't think I can represent the town anymore. <laughs> All right. Does anybody else have any questions, concerns? Thank you. So you're rid of me now. 
You don't have to listen to me anymore. No, we're going to pick your brain some more. That's yeah. not, we're, we're not done with you yet. All right. All right. All right. Well, I, I, just on a personal note, this is one of the most exciting things that I've done in the last 20 years. Cool. What this community has in front of it in the way of opportunities. And I said to Heidi, I'm too old. I'm too far advanced in my career to do things that aren't fun anymore. And I had an amazing amount of fun thinking about what the future opportunities for this community was. And I think you should be giddy about the opportunities that you have. And, and, the, and the town supported. I mean, I was sitting there. I had no idea what the town was going to do in September. I had no idea. And that was a very exciting and fairly <laughs> decisive vote. And so I, I really enjoyed it. Michael enjoyed it. And he was beside himself that he couldn't come tonight. He wanted to come to, my, uh, to, to do the wrap-up. So... Uh, we'll get the final report to you and the bill too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank well, you. I didn't make I didn't make any money. <laughs> this was uh, this was a uh, labor of love. And we thank Jeff Carr for thank all of his enthusiasm and excellent work. I'm I'm sure that what he charges us is not even close to what time he has in it. So thank you very much and thank you. You will hear from us again, I'm sure. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. And drive, yeah, drive safely. Yeah, I don't think it's snowing yet. No. No. Okay. So, moving right along. Shall we? Okay. You've got the check warrant in front of you. Okay. Has everyone had a chance to look at the check warrant? Yes. Can I have a motion to someone? I'll make that motion. I have a second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Uh, I sent an email today. I'm not sure if anyone had a chance to see it before coming. I spoke with Sharon. I knew she might have a chance to see it. Um, is there any other night next week that we have a little budget meeting? Two weeks. Two, two weeks. Two two weeks. weeks. I'm flexible. It's okay with me to change it up. Okay. Yeah. Um, and Flexible. would any night work better than another? We just want to move it in Wednesday? Whatever night you pick would be great. So the night before, <laughs> Wednesday the... 15th? 15th. Okay. Same time? I, six, can't, six, I can't do that, but it's budgeting, so I'm critical for that, so... Do you want it a different night? Doesn't matter to me. So you can't do the 15th? I can't do the 15th. Okay. No, I have another committee. Do I hear 14? 14, going once, going 14. twice. 14, 14, 14. 14? 14. 14. 14. 14. 14. So, okay. you do 14th, Heidi? Yeah. Tuesday? Uh, yeah. Five? Six. 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 Okay. 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 Sure. Okay. <laughs> it's on video. Um, while you're signing that, I did get a chance to um, get through the ARPA calculator for the arena revenue loss. And the total is $135,119, according to the government's worksheet. Hmm. <laughs> Requires any kind of motion, or or I don't know what you want to do with that, but that is the total that uh, their calculations look like. So, um, how does that work for us, Shelly? Can we move that money to them without? That's an without the towns, without a town vote because it's right. over X amount of money? It's an approved expenditure of the ARPA funds, so it would be moving it from the ARPA fund to the arena fund. But we don't need to have a no. voter approval. I would, I would think not. I can double check on that, but I don't think so. Okay. Just so we're all nice, yeah, and, nice and legal. 
I don't disagree with that a bit. No, I have I no. Shoot that out, and we can circle back around to that next meeting. Yeah, I have no problem with the amount. I have no problem with transferring it. I just. Yeah, yeah, and I'm. I, is everybody else okay with the amount Absolutely. that works for you, Ty? I'm sure that works for you. That's what works. These eyeballs? Yeah. 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 Like, They're using no. fiscal year 18 19 as the base, <coughs> and uh, they take 1920 and 2021 into consideration. Um, and then the calculation comes out to 135. So. Based on that, the 1920. 1920 and um, 2021. Right. Yeah, both of them. Hmm. Well, so yeah, I'll reach back out and just see if that needs to be voter approved. And I am waiting uh, for a response from. Katie Buckley on your other questions as far as spending either towards the appropriation for the social services or um, for the mental health and wellness. And then just a quick uh, balance, I did email you, but for the public, the delinquent tax amount is $163,258.52. Uh, there is still a tax sale scheduled for December 9th. I have uh, a house on Bernard Drive and two trailers on Arthur Drive that are still on the sale. I do believe that Bernard Drive owner will be in the pay. He says he will anyway. Um, and I'm not sure about the the lady from I don't remember what company that was. She was on uh, Zoom not too long ago speaking yeah. about the Anco mobile home property. Stated something about the but we mm -hmm. haven't seen anything from her, so so far it's still on the list. That's all I have for you. And on the that tax sale would only be on the mobile home. Mobile home. No, I on do the land. believe because it's a uh, owner. The park is owner owned. Don't they own? They own their own land. Well, let's... The town, it is just the trailer. Okay, yeah, because I was going to say, uh, I would they say they that pay. they don't own the land. The park owns, yeah, I'm not sure quite how that goes, but right. the sale is just for the trailer. Okay. Yes. Just so people know. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. Okay. Any other questions for Shelley? Moving on to Wendy. Yeah, more than me, Mom, I apologize. Uh oh. Town meeting is so many people. Oh, uh, yes. Okay, so I have minutes from November 18th, which was our last swine. Okay, has everyone had a chance to read the minutes? Yes. Do I have a motion to accept the minutes? I'll make the motion. Do I have a second? I'll second. All those in favor say aye. 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 August. I know this past year we ran into issues around field days. If you want to leave it as it is and deal with it when it gets closer, or if you want to change it now. I'd say leave it as it is and see how it all I know comes out. It hasn't been an issue, but this past round it was. Right. Everybody wants to go to the uh, Any other thoughts? Other than that, it's just the first thing, third Thursday of each month, so. And 6.30, that's still good for everybody? Yep. Okay, so if you could make a motion for the record to accept that. Do I have a motion to accept the meeting schedule? I'll make a motion. Do I have a second? Second. 
All those in favor say aye. 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 So I'm going to be working on petitions for town meeting. Um, I also did reach out to the school to find out if we were even allowed in there. Right now we are. Oh, crap. <laughs> so um, I know the legislature in early January is going to be bringing up the topic of if they're going to allow towns to make their own choices like we did last year. Um, so they're thinking it might go that route, or we'll have a choice. If we go with the floor meeting, traditional floor meeting, um, I think we should always just have a plan B if things change right. suddenly. I don't know where we're going to be after the holidays. So I just wanted to keep it in your mind. If the legislature allows us to make the decision, then um, you're going to have to make a decision what you want to do based on <coughs> what we know in early January. And right. the warning and everything has to be done by the 15th to get everything to the printers for the town report. So it's a very small window. Okay. So, but right now I did talk to the principal. He said the building is open for use, masks. So I don't know if we have a floor meeting, if it'll even be well attended, it's hard to say. Right, I'm well at 500 cases today, who knows. Right, mm -hmm. so yeah. just something to think about. Um, but we'll get through the holidays and see what January looks like before we need to make any hard decisions. Um, let's see, petitions to run on the ballot. I will be getting those ready. Those will be due to me by Monday, January 24th at 5 p.m. with 1% of our registered voter signatures, which is around 25, changes daily. Um, petitions for warned articles will be due by January 13th with 5% registered voter signatures, which is 120. Um, I'll get that stuff ready for next week. Positions on the ballot this year, there's a lot of us. Uh, I am up. Shelly is up. Sharon, you're up. Kyle. Um, and Chris, um, if you choose to continue, you would need to run for the last year of that three-year term that was Bruce's. Okay. So we will have three select board positions on the ballot. Um, Amy's term as a lister is up. Charlie as a cemetery commissioner. Uh, Amber, library trustee. And then uh, moderator, we vote on that every year for the ensuing year. So that's what will be on the ballot. Home office this year. Um, Sharon, your three-year term, Kyle's is a two, and you'll be completing one year if you so choose to run. So I'll get that stuff ready next week and on the website um, for people to pick up or print out. Um, Shelly, you want to touch on that town report deadline? I will touch on the town report deadline. Uh, January 15th has been the date that's worked pretty well for um, us as a town and also Mary Dearborn, who is my contact down at Repro, does the printing. Uh, we're typically one of the first towns, so it's a very quick turnaround. And it also gives our residents a much longer chance to review the book before voting town meeting. So we typically have it back before by February 1st to be uh, passed out around town. Um, I will say real quick on the uh, COVID cases and last year we made an exception to the social service appropriations mm -hmm. on petitioning. Did you, we want to do that again? I know I did um, just preliminary put them in the budget for discussion for the letters that I already have and there are a few that are over that $1,000 limit. Franklin County Home Health is asking for the exact same amount. Um, so maybe that's something to think about too. Yeah, because otherwise they have a house to house just like anything else and right. that has the tendency to probably better to discourage the petitions right. this year and mm -hmm. uh, worse than think so. last year, I think. Right. 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 Yeah. So for all of the regulars I will just put them in the budget as I did last year for um, 
review and approval and then to the town meeting. Does anyone have any issues with that or any I don't concerns? Have any problem with that at all. No. Okay, so let's make that a motion. Um, the only caveat, I guess, is if there were somebody Something. special that was an outrageous or, yep. you know, ought them out, yep. we'd like to pre-approve that. Absolutely. But, so what's the motion exactly? The social service appropriations. Yeah. The, the regular amounts. Okay. You're waiving the petition. Yeah. Waiving the, the over petition the requirement, yeah, yes. Which right now I think it is, I haven't seen anything from the special uh, unit of investigation. Um, and I think they were the only other one last year besides mm -hmm. Franklin County Home Health. I haven't seen anything from them. Okay. So can we have a motion for that? I'll make a motion. Okay, do I have a second? I'll second. Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Um, and these are all pretty much reminders. Um, Sue touched on a light parade. It's December 19th, 5.30. Line up at 4.30. Yes, yeah, so and we're switching the line up to the elementary school because we have ice sales at 5.30 after public skating. But we'll, there'll be somebody at the road to direct people that are going to line up. Okay. Um, <laughs> Looking for municipalities, businesses, uh, personal vehicles to line up. Yeah, remember you said Christmas was a big deal this year. <laughs> Street, <Yeah. laughs> Street legal vehicles? Make sure. <laughs> Street, uh, legal. Street legal vehicles. Yeah. Let's clarify that. Yeah. You can you put a tank, you can bring yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> Agricultural vehicles, yeah, too. Sure. So. Put your helicopter in there. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Your lighter too. That's a special plug-in. I did not know this until last year. I learned a lot last year. <laughs> okay. We all did too. So. Well, we all did. <laughs> all right. It was um, fun the route is published as Sue has been sharing. So there's plenty of places to watch. To walk from. We're going to ask. We're going to ask either uh, state police or city PD to help us with the switch from Lancaster Street on the 78. I uh, feel yeah, that's the, the biggest issue. Coming up the hill, the slow vehicles coming on the 78. But I gave them a copy of it last night. Turning left, yeah, back towards. I gave them a copy of the route last night. Okay. Okay. Um, Shelly and I published our holiday office schedule days were closed, a bunch of days we're going to be here, people need to come in, give us a shout by appointment because we both have a long list of year-end stuff to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, <coughs> you've seen the grid I shared with you uh, with the tax rates and common level of appraisals where we stand. That's always mm -hmm. interesting to see where we fall if we're in a good place. So. Um, town report dedication. We can talk about it off the of course, because we, but I, we need to start thinking about that so I can do what I need to do. I've got some ideas. I've got a couple as well. Okay, so we'll chat when they shut the camera off. Okay. Um, digitizing all this over here. Tomorrow's his last day. He's been here. Before, think before Thanksgiving, several days, and he's been here. This is the third day this, no, probably his third day this week. So he will be finishing up, and that stuff will be out of here. He's headed to Burlington to do their records for several weeks. Good boy. Yes. I, watched, <laughs> yes. I watched him do a little bit of it the other day, and it's a pretty amazing process. He That's hit some cool. snags in the older books, <coughs> not the way they were put together, there was things in there that weren't just documents, there was maps and there was overlays on things. And so they had to bring in a different setup and yeah, so it took a little longer than we thought, but we're almost there. So I think that is it for me. 
Okay. Moving on. Heidi. Hi. Um, I put a couple documents on the table that I didn't get to you in time for your packet. Um, I did, did put in the report that we've been uh, dancing with Northern Borders Regional Commission about that grant. Um, and because we received it very early in our process, we've been a year and it's time for a notice to proceed to the issue. And because of the way our budget was structured for the full project amount, they couldn't do that until we had our money secured. So what they have agreed to do is reduce the scope of the project to the part specifically paid for by Northern Board, which is um, the design, engineering, and uh, permitting, a little bit of administrative and legal. So you have a copy of the reduced scope budget on there. Um, and I think Sharon has one copy of our old budget, which was for the full uh, 3.4 million. So um, additionally, they did uh, allow us to keep the waiver. There is a COVID match waiver in place for almost all of the grant, but we did get 25,000 of EDA money in that grant. I don't know if you remember, they originally awarded us 482,000 and then they said pending the rest might come and then it came from EDA. EDA did not get the opportunity to do a COVID waiver. So you'll notice in there the town has a match of 25,000. Um, the NBRC grant is for 507,107. Point seventy six. <laughs> seventy six cents. Um, so there's nothing to sign, nothing to be changed, but I am seeking approval of the board to go in that direction. So we get a notice to proceed, then we have two years to spend the money, but if we don't get a notice to proceed, they want us to relinquish the money back into the fund. So ideally, this is how we would move forward. Okay. Any questions, concerns? Then can I have a motion to accept the reduced scope for the Northern Borders Regional uh, grant that we received? I'll make a motion. Burn, are you still contemplating? Got another twenty-five thousand dollar archaeological investigation. I'm looking at, but um, yeah. <laughs> like here. Yep. Yeah. We're busy. Business. I'll second that motion. Thank you. All those in favor, say aye. 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 And of course, those are just estimates, so we yep. don't know how it will sugar out. Um, but those are best guesses. Um, the COD. I put some information in there. They sent around a survey asking towns to. Um, start thinking about ARPA funding and about the projects that they have coming down the pipe. So what they wanted to know is, does your town have land that they might be able to locate, like a box on? Um, do they? Do you have indoor storage? You have community rooms. So they're starting to think about how they're going to implement their grants and how they would be able to interact with the different towns. What their actual plan is is still being determined. I don't know. And Michael is here, he's one of your newer representatives, so he's going to be interfacing with the Communication Union District and hopefully coming back to the town at some point soon to talk about what the local CUD is planning for this area. Uh, could I ask a question since Absolutely. the board is here? And that is, um, it was recommended in a presentation tonight that we keep going on broadband for everyone in the town of Highgate. Now, some people have some internet around, some people have Comcast around, and the question is, um, are we committed to pushing it through so that everyone has broadband internet at a minimum level of 100 
megabytes per second download and 100 megabytes per second upload. So is, is the town, uh, is the town uh, in agreement to move along on this? Or is it this something that we're going to wait and see and decide, well, maybe we will, maybe we won't? I, I need it for guidance in terms of how to work with people and, and how hard to push it. Well, frankly, I'll claim ignorance on the megabyte upload and because and, I don't know if that's good or bad. <laughs> average. <laughs> is that what they consider very, the minimum? Very average. For okay. example, my, my own is, is a gigabyte per second download and about 23 megabytes per second upload. So mine's reasonably fast, but this is kind of the middle of the range here. As opposed to a slow rate being about 23 megabytes per second uh, download and, and similar uploads. So people can be very slow and that that prevents you from downloading from various websites and literature and, and things that you would like or need. So um, this is average. It isn't to say that if you want to pay more, you can you can get more. But right. if, uh, part of the part of the the plan is that everybody gets broadband. You don't cherry pick. You don't have that option. Everybody gets the same. And the other part of it is that you want to keep the fees as low as possible. So the, the, the greater the amount of money that the, the town puts in, it allows the fees for the ultimate users to go down. Okay, so if it costs more to put the system in, then it's gonna, fees are going to be higher because they need to recover. And so, so is the board committed to push it as hard as uh, Jeff pointed out that we should and uh, uh, should be part of our, our uh, community or are we kind of maybe yes, maybe no, maybe not? I think it would help our development and help the future of our town to have everyone have the ability to have that access. Um, first of all, it puts us, you know, in the running for those people who have work-at-home jobs or have um, businesses they need to or should run. Um, I think we should push it. I do. I agree. It's so, uh, basic infrastructure these days. <coughs> yeah, it's yeah. In getting day. to be... Yeah as important as mm -hmm. roads and bridges. There's money and right now, which is good, and maybe more money coming, so that's better. And if you're talking about this virus being around a while, virtual learning and virtual work is not going to be out of the question. It's going to be with us as a new paradigm, whether you like it or not. Yep. So I, I think I'm, I'm happy the board has a, a point of view, because I, I think it's indispensable to have this kind of connection. We're, we're a small town, and this is something we can leverage quite nicely. And there's money. They have money, and right. it, it's, uh, there's different ways to skin the cat on this, but uh, we'll find the right one for us, and we'll see see how it goes. But uh, I, I think that um, it's a good investment for us, and it's a minimal one. Mm -hmm. uh, what they said at the seminar yesterday was, if for every dollar you put in the broadband, you get four dollars back, so that's pretty good. We're talking about long-term investments here, so I, I, I think that that brings us up to uh, where everybody else is, even though we're a small town and for minimum amount of, of uh, skin in the game, if you will. So, okay. Well, and it keeps our kids up in the game. Mm -hmm. Everybody. Yeah. Right. Everybody. I mean the kids especially, yes. all of this virtual learning and, and children doing their homework at Wi-Fi hotspots is yeah. just not acceptable. No, not a 20 below zero, no. It's not the thing to do. And you can watch movies without buffering. Pardon? And you can watch movies without buffering. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Vern. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> That's my sales pitch. Okay. Um, so the next thing for me is that um, the May she wrote, I have put an amendment on the table that was laid for your packet. And that's from DeWolf Engineering. So you've been doing your design. And uh, uh, the state did kind of throw them a detour last time and said they really think it's going to be important to the project to have construction at, <coughs> excuse me, access from the river rather than from the top. So that is a proposal from DeWolf to get the survey and easements necessary to go across the uh, Pine Plains Road and then out to that um, section of field across from the property, the project site. And there is a map, I think, attached to the one Sharon has for those that haven't Wasn't got the image. Was that your dad's property? Mm -hmm. Is that going to be like a bridge? I don't believe that it'll be a bridge. I think they'll either um, use flotation or... Hmm. Yeah, I don't think they can build a bridge in there. They might be able to build, you know, temporary, but I don't think they can stop the full water. I think they're talking about the barge. Floating barge. Yeah, bar. They'd have a barge that they just put in with, mm -hmm. with Legos. Yep. So I would need your authorization to um, accept that amendment to the contract for fourteen something thousand. Fourteen thousand three hundred seventy-seven dollars and four cents plus mileage. Mm -hmm. uh, the survey alone was five thousand something. Right. Because it's a permanent easement, they want to have the ability to go back and fix it by using that in the future if they need it. And because it's a federal project, they're really pushing for permanent ability so that the town wouldn't have to go through the process again. That's why it's so pricey. So what you're saying is it's probably money well spent. It's a protection for the town. Yes. Thoughts? Do we have a choice? Not really. Probably not. No. <laughs> um, there's no archaeological fees in this one, so for it. <laughs> oh, well, I don't know, so far. <laughs> it's just not outlined. Well, that'll be the next edition. <laughs> now it's, it up, so now now it's on record. Yeah. Thanks, Ver. Sorry. Uh, yeah. $25,000 yeah. study on the way. You can count on it. Next month. Next month. Yeah, because you, you know that's <laughs> river, <laughs> river land. They're going to find something. Those Indians were out there. Uh, as long as you have your sense of humor. All right, so do I have a motion to sign? I'll make that motion. Do I have a second? I'll second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, uh, next thing I just wanted to have on your radar is that the Swanton Hydro Dam is up for relicensing and they're looking for comment. Um, so big, big documents, I didn't print them for you, but you have the links and they're, they're not proposing any changes, but I did want you to know that the Northern Forest Canoe Trail is pushing to have a parking lot put in down there, electric vehicle charging station. So we're trying to figure out exactly, do they mean Mill Hill or do they mean the 207? So we've asked for a little bit more information on that so we can understand what changes are proposed. But the facility itself is not changing. Um, just so you know, the um, negotiations for the village wastewater system, we did get approval to go ahead with that appraisal. 
So I'll be putting, um, depending on how expensive it is, I may not need to put it up to bid, just get some estimates. I'm assuming it will be less than our threshold. So hopefully I'll have some uh, bids for you after next meeting. Yeah, and the involved party won't be back until the 10th of December anyway. He's out of state. Um, I don't think I need anything from you on the transfer station. Um, we're still plugging along on that, except we are back in the running for the Whisper program, which would be our sponsorship. So think positive thoughts for that. Uh, Better Back Roads. I had an opportunity to talk to Richard today. He did say he was coming tonight, so I hope everything's okay. Um, and we spoke with Butch, and Butch would like to not worry about either one of these projects this year. So they're suggesting that we don't do a Better Back Roads project. Uh, the Ballard Road is probably going to be uh, <coughs> more money than the Better Back Roads, so he was suggesting we do a structure grant for that when the AOT grants open up. And the price of fix. So that's why it's been low on the list. Uh, when we chatted with Bethany, she suggested, well, check with um, AOT about your Mesa Road project and see, because it's your access, maybe we could lump it in with that. Right. Check with Ross on that, and he said he would not encourage you to do that because it's a federal project, and it's going to take a long time to oh. get that going, and you could be ready to go to construction on the Mesa Road, oh, and you'd be held up. So he said it, it's probably a bad move strategically to lump that in with that project. So, um, and it's a tricky one because <coughs> it's a class four. Right. So I don't think we can get an AOT grant for it. Yeah, but if it collapses, you also don't have any access to your... Yeah. Your other. Yep. So it's definitely on the radar, something that has to be looked at. It's going to take some creativity, I think. So, uh, so that's all I have on the Better Back Roads, and the AOT grants haven't opened up yet. So um, there was an update on uh, the community visit. They, they have requested a um, uh, short list of people they're going to reach out to see if they want to be on the steering committee and then those people will get together and make a list of how they want to proceed people to invite and then they will pick the site for the event which will be held in February. Um, you have the SA the St. Albans Police Department draft contract in front of you uh, Vern also mentioned getting others, so maybe you want to just mention on camera that anybody that's interested in submitting a bid for that is welcome to, and I'll try and circulate something. All right, and we talked earlier too, not only is our policing contract up, but our ambulance services contract is up as well. And for our legal due diligence, that needs to be put out to bid, so we will be putting that out to public bid, not that there are a lot of people that have that ability to do that job, but that legally covers the town because of the amount of money that it requires to provide the services. Since the microphone is not working I'm having a little technical difficulties. Okay. Um, so Boone Drive, there was a letter in your packet mm -hmm. regarding a re uh, concern for Boone Drive um, maintenance. And I did put information in there. Um, if you'd prefer to discuss that in executive 
if there's a legal yeah. issue. Um, so I would just mention also that there was a um, request from the ACO to consider looking at your dog ordinance again um, for a potential leash law in the village. So if you want, I can schedule Shelby coming up um, in one of your future meetings to discuss that with you. Yes, that would be fun. And you do have, um, on January 4th, not your next meeting because it was just budgeting, you do have MVR coming in and sales police department. I think that's it for me. Okay. Select board, do you have anything for open discussion? No. <coughs> okay. So, again, the rec is doing the holiday uh, light parade, but they are also doing the deck the halls. So, get your Christmas lights out there and participate and be a flashing, annoying house to your neighbors. That's my plan. Okay, thank you very much for coming. Uh, I would make a motion to exit the regularly scheduled select board meeting and enter into executive with Heidi Bridge Valenta. Ty said you do that. Yeah, and Ty Schwarn here. I have a second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 aye.